to welcome you all to our first seminar in the series, a seminar that we organized. Um, it is a joint seminar organized together by Scholarly Communication Research Group that I am part of, together with Christian, who is here with us as a second organizer. And we organized it in collaboration with Pathes Society. So it is also my great pleasure to welcome Soren, who, of course, um, represents Pathes um, as a chairman of the Pathes board. Um, the seminar is about um, university and ontology. We have six quite exciting meetings uh, before us. Um, basically, the idea behind the seminar is to approach um, people from different uh, national contexts, different theoretical perspectives, and ask them to tackle the question um, about university and ontology and try to maybe untangle um, the relation between those two notions. Um, we start today with uh, a very special guest. Uh, here with us is uh, Ron Barnett, um, who will deliver, deliver the very first talk in our series. And um, hopefully he will provide some grounds for um, future future discussion. Uh, I think that uh, Ron, of course, needs little introduction, um, as, as he's probably uh, familiar to most of us. Nonetheless, um, uh, nonetheless, um, I will mention um, several things um, about Ron, who is Emeritus Professor of Higher Education at University College London Institute of Education, where he was a Dean and Pro-Director. He was a chair of the Society for Research in Higher Education. He was awarded the inaugural prize by the European Association for Educational Research for his outstanding contribution to higher education research, policy and practice, and is president of the Philosophy and Theory of Higher Education Society. Uh, he has played the major part in developing the philosophy of higher education. So this is something that we probably um, had in mind when, when approaching Ron and asking him to give this very first, um, first talk. Um, of course, um, if someone here at the audience is, is, um, is new to, uh, to the subfield of philosophy of higher education, I can only highly recommend um, getting as soon as possible uh, familiar with, with, with Ron's book um, this is a great entry point for anyone interested in um, philosophy of higher education. So, Ron, once again, it's a great pleasure that you accepted our invitation, I, and I can only um, pass the voice to you. The floor is yours. Um, we will proceed in the following manner. Ron will deliver his talk, and then we will have a time for open discussion. So you are all very welcome to um, join us in this discussion and we will moderate it after Ron's talk. Thank you very much. Ron, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jacob, and uh, hello to everybody um, in whichever country you're in and um, whatever the weather is like where you are. Now, I'm going to try and uh, call up um, my PowerPoint presentation. So let's just me do that if I can with you. Oh, um, I, Jakob, I've got a, a message saying host disabled screen sharing. How do I get All right, that? this is Christian. Could you please provide Ron's the necessary? Um, yeah, it's all right right now, sorry. It, it should be on right, okay. right now. Ron. I'll try it again. Oh, I think this is all right now. Let me just try. All right. Okay. Good. Hopefully everybody can see that. Good. Okay. Lovely. Well, um, I'm going to get my skates on and go through fairly briskly, but I just um, say one or two things before I get going, if I can. First of all, although I've used the term ontology in my writings a fair bit, um, I've always been hesitant to do so. It's such a huge term and concept. So I'm a bit diffident about doing it here. Um, and it, it does seem to me to just pose so many uh, difficulties. The other thing is that I've never spoken or written specifically on the topic of ontology. And so uh, this is very much a first shot. 
And what I'd like in the discussion is not only for you to ask questions, by all means ask questions, but don't expect me to answer them. Um, uh, what I'm hoping for in, in the question and so-called question and answer session is that you will offer me your critiques and your critical comments and insights so that I can learn uh, from your, your own thinking uh, on the matters I want to raise. Now, I'm going to try and develop a few thoughts about the relationship between ontology, ideas, and the university. So I'm, trying to, going, to, I'm going to try and explore relationships between those three domains, ontology, ideas, and the university. So that's what I'm going to try and do. So let me get cracking if I can. So uh, some starting points if I can. First of all, I believe that there is a world independent of human beings and independent of our ideas about the world. Uh, but that human beings, ever since we've been on this planet, have been trying to understand the world. Uh, unfortunately, the world doesn't give up its secrets very easily or very lightly. And much of the world remains out of our, out, out of our reach. Um, there are large and murky forces at work, and we can only dimly discern what they are and the makeup and nature of those forces and their relationships with each other and with us. The university is an extraordinary social institution which has been brought into being and developed over time to advance our understandings of the world. So it plays a particular part in, in this story. Our education I take to be simply educational processes associated with the university which are assisting students to help to understand the world. But I don't intend to talk about that matter, educational processes and higher education today. I'm going to focus on, on the university. So university, ontology and ideas. That's where I'm focusing today. Now already, here's a running what I've just said. What's, what should count as the world? we use this word world, what, what do we mean by it? And informing understandings of the world, what is the relationship between the knower and the known, the knower and the world? And what is to count as understanding the world? And are there particular responsibilities on universities in helping the formation of understandings of the world? So already we've got some pretty big questions in front of us. Now, I've so far not used the words ontology and epistemology. When I wrote my first book, um, I worried as to whether or not I should or could use those terms. They're not terms that people normally use as they go about their everyday life. And they're a bit frightening and off-putting. And, and they're very large and murky and abstract. And I like to see when I write and when I speak, how far we can get in using pretty conventional words. So I try and avoid them if I can, but I think unfortunately I'm going to have to use them a bit in this talk. But I, just by the way, a bit of light relief. I like, like a bit of light relief from time to time. The great Italian conductor, um, Carlo Giolini, once spoke about his conducting Mozart's 40th symphony. And he was in his middle age and he said he had been rather tentative in coming to conduct it and hadn't conducted it until he was well into his conducting career. Because for him, although he was a big name and, and, and well, obviously well used to the repertoire, for him, Mozart's 40th Symphony was a huge work. Well, that's how I feel about ontology and epistemology. They're huge concepts and I rather deign to use them. But anyway, uh, you've invited me in a way to have a go at ontology, so I'm going to have to use it in my talk. Um, uh, 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 but I'll do so as little as I can. We'll see how it goes. Now, I'm going to 
make more than a nod to the work of the philosopher Roy Basker. Many of you will have heard of him, many of you, some of you may have read some or much of his work, others perhaps not. Um, I was privileged to become a friend of Roy uh, before he died, and I've been much influenced by Roy, but I'm, I find, or I found in getting to know his work, that in effect what Roy does for me is provide a language and a frame and frameworks which have helped me to understand what I've been doing. In other words, as Richard Pring, another philosopher of education said of his work, in other words, Roy Basker, I've always been a, a critical realist. That's what Roy has helped me to understand. And uh, I, as I say, I find some of his work helpful, but um, I think there are points at which I want to extend his philosophy and I'll do that as I go along. It's worthwhile noticing that the phrase critical realism was not Roy's originally, although he is known as the originator of the philosophy of critical realism. Uh, but that's just a, a little aside. For, for Roy, there are hidden forces in the world. The world is re real, it has an independence of human being and it contains hidden forces which act upon us and, uh, and, and on human beings, obviously, and, and, and on human society. But he went further, being hit, hidden world, the, the, the world contains forces that are at greater depths than others. And he used terms like stratified reality, laminated uh, reality. And you have a sense in his philosophy of levels interwoven and uh, uh, at different levels and heights. And, and you also have a sense that some are so deep, some levels are so deep that they're hidden. So that's a kind of beginnings of a schema that I find helpful. Now, what is real? Well, Roy distinguished between, as he put it, the real, the actual and the empirical. And basically these are different levels of, of ontology, different ontological levels, different levels in the real, uh, as we might put it. And some people have, who have taken up his work in education have tried to distinguish well where uh, the real, the empirical and the actual and tried to identify where these are. I think that's a game we should be wary of playing. What I would say is that these terms, real, actual, and empirical, are, are a kind of heuristic, and they help us have a sense that there are forces uh, at different levels, there are different ontological levels for us in the natural world and in the human world, uh, which affect us as human beings and society and indeed the natural world. So to use a metaphor, the world's like an iceberg. There's only a little bit of it easily available to us at any one time and much of it is is invisible and is lying at great depths and is exerting force and Roy had the phrase generative mechanisms there are massive forces working at deep levels affecting the world and the way we are but I want to say that it's a world emotion I strangely you don't get a sense of motion very much, I think, in Roy's work. Um, you might, know, might disagree. And I also want to put into the conversation that the forces in the world, in the real of the world, are in conflict with each other. They are, to use a favorite for a word of Slavo Žižek, they are antagonistic towards each other. Uh, so I want to I talk of different levels of ontology, which are moving in all sorts of directions and which are antagonistically related to each other. So you have all sorts of conflicts, antagonisms going on in this world. 
um, in both the human and the non-human worlds without any Hegelian resolution. On my shelves behind me, I know exactly where it is. There's a little book by Irigare on Heidegger called The Forgetting of Air in Martin Heidegger. I only mention that because it's a nice title. And I want to say that if I can chance my arm, that we can say the same about critical realism. It's got lots of depths and they're all layered on top of each other, but there's no air. Uh, and I want to inject some air into the model. Uh, and I want to do that in a pretty big way. Air gives us height. Roy gave us lots of depth and I want to inject into the schema height and air. And just by the way, for those of you who are interested, um, John Henry Newman, the great English writer in the 19th century on the idea of the universities has used the word ascent. And I think that's quite nice. Roy gives us a sense of going down into depths. And I also want to put into the idea of ontology, a sense of going upwards and having height and air. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Now, I also want to suggest, funnily enough, that Roy rather neglected the world of thought. He spoke a lot about powers, um, and it was there lurking in the background, but he, because he's so focused on ontology and wanted to bring ontology into philosophy, that he, for me, he rather neglected the matter of thought. Now, Roy poses, as we just said, three layers of depth in his ontology. And so I would like to posit three layers of height in relation to Roy's three levels of depth. And I want to suggest these terms for the different layers of, uh, of ideational height, ideational or ideas as such, imaginary, being imaginative about ideas, bringing new ideas into the world, new senses of the world. For those of you who know, the word imaginary has appeared in titles of books by both Charles Taylor and John Paul Sartre, uh, and they're quite different. Taylor thinks about imaginaries as con continuing traditions, whereas Paul, John Paul Sartre, as you might imagine, sees the imaginary as liberating us, freeing us from where we are. So that's sense of imaginary. But then on top of imaginary, I want to have another ideational la layer, that of utopia. So let's look at that uh, within this diagram. And here you have in the bottom, you have Roy's ontological levels, the empirical, the actual and real. And then on the other side, rising into the heavens, you have my uh, ideational levels of ideas, the imaginary and utopia, ascending heights of ideas of the university. And the university, it seems to me, is an extraordinary institution in that it straddles or tries to link and open up both the real on the one hand and this ideational world on the other hand. Now, that obviously presents us with all sorts of problems and issues. What are the relationships between the structures that Roy wanted to talk about and the structures or schema of ideas that I'm positing? And that's a very real issue, um, whether we're talking about uh, forces, structures in the natural world or, or in the human world. How do they affect our ideas? And I think they do quite profoundly. But as I say, there are really com complicated issues here, which I haven't got to the bottom of, that we should note arising out of uh, modern philosophy over the last two or 300 years. So whereas, as I've noted, for example, Roy Basket talks about generative mechanisms, implying that the real, can affect us in quite profound ways, Schopenhauer said, the noumenal cannot be involved in any causal relationship. 
Now you have a fundamental difference of view there, it seems to me. Roy was quite clear that the real can uh, pose and can effect causal changes in us as human beings. So you have a problem there of that relationship. But I also want to make it more complicated and say there are problems of what I would call intervening variables between the real and our thought about the world. Things get in the way. I mean, we've got the long centuries old conversation about primary and secondary qualities that in her in here in objects is there anything in objects which are, are really real and things that we impose on them as as part of our perceptual apparatus but you've also got issues like ideology and now in the 21st century the digital age you've got issues about disinformation misperceptions the things are getting in the way between us and the world all the time and it's very difficult to know what that relationship is and all the time we impose we bring into view into play technologies different frameworks of one kind or another so the world is affecting us and we're trying to glimpse the world and things get in the way and we might throw out our hands and say, oh, it's all too complicated, too difficult. But I want to note that we can only use a term like the Anthropocene, provided that we want A, to posit that there is a world external to us and that we've had effects on it and that we can begin to grasp something about the external world even though it's all very murky and difficult. So here's another problem that the way I'm looking at ontology raises, the matter of reason. Reason becomes an, a problem, as I, I've just implied. How can it help and, and in what ways can it help and to what degree can it help in discerning the world and in receiving messages from the world? Does reason even get in the way? And perhaps it does sometimes, perhaps Western, particularly Western, modern epistemology has actually got in the way of discerning the world. We've reason has become a kind of technology that affects a barrier between us and the world and has had pernicious effects on the world. And we've changed the world almost imperceptibly. David Backhurst, uh, philosopher of education, has spoken about ed education as offering a space of reason. And I want to suggest that's a rather limited notion. I want to see the university, if reason is going to play any part at all, the, I want to suggest the university is a space of reasoning not to get away from the sense that there is an object or an entity we can call reason, but hang on to the possibility that human process, collective processes of reasoning can help us begin to get to grips with this difficult and murky world, a world that many of us feel that we've been spoiled and is now having pernicious effects back upon us. But at any rate, there's, we have effected in the Western world, especially over the last 300 years, a separation between thought and the world. And the question is, what role reason can play in bringing the world and thought and human beings together in a fruitful way? And as I say, it may be that there are real problems to be overcome there. So, this relationship between ontology and the ideational realm is, it seems to me, of vital significance to us uh, in education, and particularly for a social institution like the university, which is presumably, a, we might say, a social institution designed to help us uh, understand the world increasingly in better ways. So I'm wanting to say that deep structures of the world can affect our ideas, but but I want to hang on to the possibility, and indeed, 
necessity that ideas can affect the deep structures of the world and that they have done so. And that, as I was saying a moment ago, is implicit in the very notion of the Anthropocene. Now, the ideas have actually profoundly affected the real of the world. The universe is now culpable for effecting malign changes in the real of the world. But at a more prosaic level, ideas have affected universities, have affected the formation of universities. Many universities across the world, in all parts of the world, the Global South and the Global North, have been established at partly as a result of particular ideas of com communities or individuals coming together with particular ideas. My own university, University College London, is a very interesting case in point because it was born out of a group of utilitarian philosophers coming together in London and wanting to set up a rival institution to Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, and it, they produced what was called the Godless College of Gower Street, University College London, uh, uh, a rival to the to the God-fearing colleges of Oxford and Cambridge. But I only say that to make the point that ideas can affect massive institutions because now U University College London, a massive institution, global institution, nobody can understand it. It's there, it's independent of human life in a way, <laughs> uh, 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 of thought and ideas, even though it was born out of ideas. It has a an ontological dimension and significance and status such that nobody can fully ever understand it. I just give that as a little local example. These massive institutions, as it happens, universities, have themselves an ontological independence of humanity and even of the ideas out of which they might have been formed. Here's a little light relief. I like to inject a little humour if I can from time to time. This, uh, this is a quotation I've just stolen from the, uh, from the transcript of a very recent um, debate in the House of Commons, the Parliament of, the, of, of England, of the United Kingdom. And it was, it was, a, it was a commentary on on when, when members of parliament be, you know, come into the chamber for the first time, they're expected to give, a, give, give an inaugural a humorous speech. And this is a comment on what uh, a, a new member of parliament has just said. Um, she summed up what social value is. Uh, sorry, I've got, oh, let me just see. She summed up what social value is in an excellent description of what it means in the city of Chester. So the, the Member of Parliament was talking about social value in the city of Chester. I very much disagree with what the right honourable member for North East Somerset, Mr Rees Mogg, said about social value being in the eye of the beholder. I do not think it's true. So there's an, this is a little commentary. This is all very humorous in the formal chamber of the the uh, the, the democratic structures of the United Kingdom, a little humorous aside going on between members about social value being in the eye of the beholder. I do not think that is true. Well, this is actually quite crucial to us here today. Can value in her, in her, in the world, independently of human interests? Is nature inherently of value? Or is it the value simply that we put onto the world? and then becomes an interest, say, to the university and its members. Can the world be of inherent value? This is a fundamental issue in front of us. Is social value in the eye of the beholder, or does it rely in the world in itself? And I want to just press these points. There's a problem here I'm raising implicitly, which we might call a problem of dualism. Now you remember Descartes, I think therefore I, I, I am, 
way he, he that was a birth, one of the births of modernism, a, a separation of the knower from the known. And that, that whole way of thinking has given birth, I suggest, to instrumentalism, to the instrumentalism that runs through Western epistemology. And that has gone on to give rise to what's being termed in the social theory literature, extractivism, the way in which we've, we're using and have used our knowledge to extract resources from the world. So there's been a separation here of ontology and epistemology, which indigenous communities by and large do not possess. Indigenous communities see themselves as much more embedded in the world rather than separated from it. And this conflation, it seems to me, holds hostages to fortune. We, we're probably familiar with seeing terms like onto epistemology in the literature. I rather back away from that because that does conf conflate ontology and epistemology. So I want to have my cake and eat it. I want to keep them separate and I want to bring them closer together. The trouble with a phrase like onto epistemology in the end might suggest that I'm made entirely by the world, I'm entirely embedded in the world, and I can do no other, so I'm not responsible for my actions. Or, round the other way, since I'm embedded in the world, I can do what I like with the world. So either, either seem to be pretty catastrophic. So I want to hold on to some separation of the world from our knowledge of the world while also wanting to hold on to a sense of strong relationships between the two, the world and I, our, our ideas. Now, this is how I see the university as straddled between the ontological domain on the left-hand side of the diagram and the imaginative side of the diagram. I'm sorry the diagram is so tiny. Uh, if any of you are interested, you can see it in one of my recent books. Um, the philosophy of higher education. Uh, it's on page 34. But what I'm trying to do here is I'm saying that the university is straddled and does try to hold a relationship between the ontological domain and the imaginative domain. I want to suggest, and I suggest that the university can be understood and is tacitly understood by all of us as sitting on different planes. And I posit three here. The, the basic plane, the one at the bottom, is the university is an institution in the world and the university is idea. And I've just given you an example of University College London. There it is, a university in the world, and it's a set of ideas about it, about it in the world. The next level up, the next plane, is a university as an institution of time and space. Every university has its own time and space location. But a university also has its possibilities and each university has its own place, time and space location, and it's also got its own possibilities. So that's another plane. And the upper plane is that of particulars and universality. Each university has might be characterized and identified by its particulars. They, its particulars are infinite, but nevertheless, they are particulars of a university in its technologies, its staff, its resources, its disciplines, and so on and so forth. But we might also, we also do understand universities through universals of truth, of knowledge, and, and, and education, and so on and so forth. So universities, is sitting, as it were, on these three planes, and they're all dynamic, they're all moving, they're all relationships between them. So you've got this, this, in this situation of universities trying to understand the world through different ideas of the world, and you've got all these different planes moving at the same time. It's a highly dynamic uh, situation, which of course makes life more and more complicated. So it's an interconnected world. Now, it, it, it 
and this was certainly implicit in some way in Roy Basker's philosophy of critical realism, but I don't think he, for me, he went as far as he might have done in developing the theme of interconnectedness. Now, some people want to say, building on, for example, Schopenhauer, that the world is undifferentiated. I wouldn't go that far. I want to say that we can speak of clusters of entities in the world, and philosophers have been recently talking about assemblages, for example. Uh, where a, a term I prefer is that of ecosystems. Uh, and I've got a theory of what I mean by an ecosystem. Uh, let me just, I'm just, just give me a moment, please. I just want to think what I, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to see whether I wanted to tell you what I think about what ecosystems are. Ecosystems are clusters of entities in the world that hang together in some way, that have been very often affected by human beings and human thinking and have been impaired in some way. They are of inherent value to the world and to us as human beings. But as I say, they've been very often impaired as a result of our actions and our ideas. And so the responsibilities on universities in relation to ecosystems and seeing how they can bring their resources to bear to mitigate the, the impairments that ecosystems present with. But I want to go on to say that not only do we have these ecosystems moving around the world in dynamic formations? It is fundamentally dynamic. It's a world in motion. And by the way, you've only got to look at uh, the COVID crisis, and I don't think it's been properly examined for its philosophical interest, not its practical interest or its biological interest, but its philosophical interest, because it shows just how dynamic the world is. If you think about all the different systems that the COVID crisis has exposed as being interrelated of health systems, of transport systems, of biological systems, societal systems, and so on and so forth. So you've got this crazy world with all its ecosystems moving around and bumping into each other. Uh, an old fashioned word is that of will, the universe and human society is invested with will. This is a Schopenhauer term which uh, I still like to hang on to uh, sometimes, but the, you've also got related notion of spirit. For me, the world is not inert. Ontology, therefore, is not inert. I've been trying to get that across. It's dynamic. Moreover, it's conflicted. There are conflicts and antagonisms. Even in the natural world, there are conflicts, uh, you might say, as entities bump into each other. and that they have their hierarchies. So I want to say that all of this, this movement, this spirit, this will, call it what you will, is part of the human world as well. Um, and so you have this total instability in the world and in our representations about the world. And for those of you who know my writing, this is where the idea of super complexity comes into play. Complexity is in the world, and it's, it's a feature of this dynamic and interconnected world that's in motion. But super complexity is a reflection of the way in which our ideas are emotion, in emotion. And this is all very much emergent. Emergence was a concept that Roy Basker in particular developed. I'm not sure whether it's his originally, but certainly he developed it. Uh, emergence is a feature of open systems, as he put it. And so you have this, I'm suggesting to you as a theorem, of instability in the world plus complex interconnected open systems, and that produces emergence. The world is unpredictable, always strange things happening, both in the natural and in the social worlds, things that we, we cannot and could not 
uh, predict. It's a feature of open complex systems. So all these features, the real of the world, layers, systems and structures in the world, complexity of these structures, antagonisms and conflict in these structures, their interconnectivity and emergence. This seems to me the character of the world we're in. It's no wonder that it's very difficult for human thought to get on top of it, partly because human beings are all the time interacting with it. There is no, as it were, independent position for us to obtain while we try to discern the way the world is. And so this total, this totally unstable world applies not only to nature, but it implies, applies to the human world and it applies to ideas about the world as well. Lessons of the Anthropocene. I've been suggesting that the world affects us and our ideas about the world and our ideas can affect the world and have affected the world. And indeed, it's only because of the way in which our ideas can affect the world that we can sensibly talk about the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene holds both the human world and the world in dynamic relationship. So the Anthropocene depends upon, in effect, the uh, very idea of ontology. There is a world independent of us. Moreover, we have affected that world in malign ways, whether we realize it or not, in ways we can, we're not even fully able to understand at the moment. There's a lot of work going on trying to understand that. So what I want to say is that there are generative structures, not only in the real of the world, as Roy Basker said, but there are generative structures or mechanisms in our ideas in ways we fully don't, don't fully understand. I touched on it earlier with the concept of ideology. Ideology gets its grip through a sense that our ideas are structuring the way in which we, we have come to understand the world. Basker spoke a great deal, and in fact, always had a, a book fully on the, on the thesis that reasons can be causes. He wanted to show how human beings can become agents independent of while still being in the natural world. And I want to say that ideas themselves can contain their own generative mechanisms, and that holds, I think, matters of concern for us because we're not aware of the way in which ideas are affecting at a deep level, at a structural level, are affecting the way we understand the world. So when we talk about materialism, when we talk about instrumentalism, when we talk about racism, we're really talking about fundamentally deep structures hidden from us in our ideas, which are structuring the way we're looking at the world. So the university in this this real world, its ecological situation. I want to say that the university is situated in a number of ecosystems through which it, it relates to the world. And there you are, there's what I was saying earlier about how I understand the very idea of ecosystem. And I want to say that the university is especially interrelated with eight ecosystems. And here you have the eight ecosystems. I hope there are eight there. Yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you've got knowledge, learning, culture, the natural environment, social institutions, human person, human identity, persons understood each one as an ecosystem, the polity and the economy. Now note that you've got the economy there, you've also got the natural environment there, but they are not given privileged status. They are just two of eight major ecosystems through which the university relates to the world and through which the, the world relates to the university. And you remember what I was saying about ecosystems, they are inherently worthwhile, they're interconnected, 
but that they are very often impaired partly as a result of human endeavors and human thought and technologies. So here you have the work, the university in its ecological setting. So what does this mean? Now, that the university is a space in which the real and ideas and will or spirit come together. Universities are not inert. They are imbued with spirit, spirit which is very often diminished as a result of managerial and technological developments, which we won't go into here. But the university is this space where the real, the ideational domain and will or spirit come together. And you've got clashes in all three domains, conflicts without resolution. This is the nature of the university today, trying to get to grips with the world, trying to develop ideas about the world, imbued or not with spirit that might be, or, 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 or a will that might be now languishing or diminishing. Ideally, each inspires the other two, the real, the ideational world and spirit. They're all helping each of the other two, unending momentum. And it's up and it's open there from as a moot question whether or not we're, we're witnessing progress or whether we're wit witnessing a falling back. So conclusions, university and higher education. I've focused, focused on university around higher education, but we have here a deep ontological substrate, which is be beyond our full understanding and always will be, but it's crucial. And so it's crucially important for the philosophy of higher education to acknowledge this. The real affects the university and the university affects this real. And this has been going on and is going on still today. But I want to add to this relationship between the university and the real or ontology, the world of ideas and imagination. And I've been suggesting that for me, Roy Basker underplayed this domain of the world of ideas and imagination. And Bush, by the way, Roy Basker is rather rude about Karl Popper, but Karl Popper, it seems to me, was nearer the mark on this matter than Roy Basker, because Karl Popper did see the world and I, our ideas in it as in a relationship together. But it seems to me only if we have this sense of this triple sense of the world, spirit and ontology can we make sense of a notion like the Anthropocene and this isn't just a matter for us as philosophers this is a, a fundamental fundamentally important matter for the world because out of this and rights is matters for the world but also for higher education and for the university matters of responsibility and of action and you'll remember the old maxim that's no ought from is. Well, I want to say on the contrary, there are lots of oughts from is. Thanks very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, I, I, I think we can all agree that um, it was uh, enormously helpful um, in, uh, in your effort to, to, to ground this question about um, university and ontology. I, I personally think that your position is quite unique because um, what, I, what I see in, um, in your approach towards this problem um, is a sort of ontological turn. You also... Um, you also start from um, going beyond this um, Descartian legacy of uh, dichotomies which produce the separation of ontology and epistemology. But what is unique about it in your position, I think, is precisely the influence of Roy Baskar, because in many people who engage in the ontological turn, we clearly see that that the ontological turn leads them away from certain realist perspective, which is which is which is there in, in, in your proposition, right? For example, in 
anthropology, in in, eth in ethnography, where where people are um, discussing um, ontological turn. Now this is a huge, of course, debate. Usually, this leads them away from from realism, right? And, and I think it's it's quite unique that. Um, as I'm seeing it, while you are advocating for a certain ontological turn, you yet retain this sense of um, realist um, ontology. Of course, in a spe specific Baskarian uh, sense, but uh, nonetheless, it is present um, uh, in, in, in your position. I find it quite, quite unique and, and very interesting. Okay, um, I think we will move towards uh, towards open discussion because we are a bit uh, behind um, schedule. Uh, I personally have some questions, uh, but I will be happy to um, share the floor with uh, other participants. So maybe I will just um, ask you um, if you can raise the hand uh, or give us any um, indication uh, if you would like to post something and maybe I will join. Okay, I, I see a question from Annie Pirier. And um, so, uh, Annie, please um, join thank us. Thank you. Discussion. First of all, thank you very much for, Ron, uh, for that, Ron. It, it really lifted my spirits. I was just wondering, it's not really a question, I was just wondering, just as you make a distinction between, you say, instead of Bacchus emphasis on reason, there should be an emphasis on reasoning. I'm just wondering in relation to your diagram, whether the university as an institution needs to be supplanted by a horrible contemporary notion of the university as a as a process of institutionalization because i think that's what i struggle with um this just as i struggle with professionalization i struggle with institutionalization um and the only way to survive this is to come up for air and to um, to float freely and and join other ecosystems. It was just a, it was a minor linguistic point. As there is reason and reasoning, so there is institution and institutionalization. Well, uh, thank thank you, Annie, for that. I don't think you've raised a minor point at all. I think it's very profound, if I can say so. Uh, a lot, very large set of issues and ideas that uh, you've just raised. Um, and I, I fully agree with the with, with what I sense is lurking there in what you're saying. That, uh, and I think it, it very much chimes with what I was saying, that universities are in danger of having the energy and the life and the air squeezed out of them. And we're seeing this all the time these days, it seems to me, um, as uh, colleagues in universities um, are, are slaving away, if I can put it that way, having to perform according to all sorts of pernicious uh, performance indicators. And so they become busier and busier producing and doing all sorts of things, uh, trying to achieve all sorts of impact. Um, uh, and just running very fast uh, to stand still. Um, and in the end, life and energy and creativity are sucked out of our institutions. Um, and I think therefore there are profound challenges placed here for anybody understanding this line of thought on what we mean by leadership in universities and I distinguish sharply the concept of leadership and management and by the way I don't want to rubbish management we need good competent managers in what are complex institutions I've been around the block and I've worn all the t-shirts uh, many times and we need good management but we need leadership and it's a different kind of concept and when I was in leadership positions that's what I was trying to do. I tried to open up the windows and let in the air. And, and I would be a bit naughty and I would bring people together who didn't want to talk to each other. And you'd see the body language, but we have to bring, find ways of creating conversation in universities today, bringing in the air. So there's 
both a malign way of looking at the notion of institutionalization and a more beneficial way of looking at it, it seems to me, um, of bringing the resources of these extraordinary institutions we call universities together in such a way that they can maximize and create energies. Uh, and if you like, going back to my talk, to be sites of greater emergence. How do we create open, more and more openness so that there can be more and more ideas, more and more emergence so that the fundamental conservative ideas of our age can be critiqued. Um, I do mind if I just go back to also one or two of the things that Jakob was saying, uh, as uh, uh, Jakob, as you kindly opening up the discussion, uh, because uh, I think too, if I can say so, you were already raising a number of very large, uh, massive um, issues we can't quite deal with today. But you were really posing the issue for me as to a relationship between ontology and being. And I think he Heidegger has a lot uh, to answer for here uh, with the title of his book, uh, um, I'm just looking around behind with being and time. Um, uh, because he, he wanted to he put a, wanted to pose a relationship between ontology and being. Now in higher education, philosophy of higher education, as distinct from philosophy of the university, philosophy of higher education, colleagues are quite understandably interested in the being of students. Um, and so, and that's and and so they. I'm going to be a bit rude and naughty here. So unfortunately, that is a field in which being an ontology are too much conflated. Um, the being of students is enormously important and difficult and complicated, and we need to get into it and know more, much more about it. But it's it's not. It's, we it, we're, we're on a false track if we see that a, as a, as itself filling out the notion of ontology. Ontology is a much, much bigger idea as I've tried to, uh, to try to indicate. But there are other issues. I mean, I don't want to hold the, uh, hold the discussion here too much because uh, probably others want to get in, but I just wanted to say there are really big issues here. Um, about what Roy called constructivism and, uh, and, and realism. Roy developed his ontological philosophy very much in opposition to, partly in opposition to constructivism, the sense that was emerging in Western epistemology that we, we do and can construct the world and that's, that's that is the world. We can't really get beyond our constructions of the world. And Roy was saying, that's completely wrong. There is a world independent of our constructions of the world uh, and wanted to push that idea. And I think that's fundamentally important here. I think we're, we have got ourselves into a pickle in the philosophy of, of education generally and philosophy of higher education in particular in giving too much credence this, I'm, so I know I'm treading on toes in giving too much credence to the world that students and and we construct for ourselves. This is a absolutely a fundamental point. And uh, why? Because, for example, take the concept of ideology. We cannot do justice to the concept of ideology unless we have a sense that there is a world beyond our constructions of the world. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't want to push that too much, but I just want to say, Jakob, that the points you were making as you were opening up the discussion are of huge and fundamental importance as to how we understand the philosophy of education, particularly the philosophy of higher education. Uh, and, and we can't understand a social institution like the university unless we have a sense of it having a real situation independently of us. And that's why I wanted to be very homely about University College London, 
And when, when you get out of the train, you're going to a strange university, you get into a taxi you, and you ask the taxi driver to take you to the University of X. And if the city you're in has got two universities, that taxi driver might not have a nice vocabulary and conceptual apparatus for talking about the university, but that taxi driver will have a sense that those two universities are different, that they've got a different history, that they stand differently in the world, and so on and so forth. So all I'm doing in here with you today is in a rather more fancy way, just offering an imaginative reconstruction of what we know already about the university. Okay, thank, thank you for clarifying this point. <laughs> this was this was large <laughs> question indeed. Um, anyone else uh, that would like to join us and, and um, add something to um, the issues that we already have raised? Andrew, I, I I see your hand. I think Christian was there first, but Christian was first there. Okay, oh, I, I let you speak first, and and I, and I will go back to Christian. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, thank you, and um, thank you very much, uh, Ron. Um, gauntlet thrown down since I'm I'm going to be responding to this in some way as well. But you you really provoked me by um, bringing in Schopenhauer, because this is, I think, when you're drawing in this notion of the real and ideas and will coming together, it sparked for me the question of, do we need to be using ontology then at all as, as a term? To, or to what extent is it useful? Is there a danger that we're going in the direction that this is, okay, well, we've been dealing with things like epistemology for a long time, and that has been a way that we framed things in terms of epistemic injustice. Uh, is this now another shift that's, in the sense, a, a fashion in thought, or do you think there's something there that's useful if it's used in a, in a restricted way? Well, uh, thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, hi there. <laughs> uh, nice to see you. Um, uh, well, you, you're touching on the territory that I kind of touched on in my very first two or three slides, and I said that I'm diffident or nervous about using these huge terms. And I've always tried to shy away from them. Um, and uh, you know, even term like globalization, I didn't use that for a long, long time. I, I'm fearful of these big terms. <laughs> uh, and I think we should try and use plain terms when we can. That's always been my, my philosophy of writing as a writer. Um, uh, partly because I'm a very simple soul, as you covered. Um, but I, I, th I think there is something in what you say that we've got to be very careful, at least, in using a term like ontology. And I'm afraid, you know, I do a lot of examining at doctorate level. And very often these days in thesis, um, you'll get a 80 pages or so of a literature review, and then you get another 80 pages or so of research methodology. And you get this phrase, epistemology and ontology, just being thrown at you, bombarded at you all the time. Mm -hmm. And you just wonder how much thought, not just reading, but how much thought people have given to these terms. I'm sorry, I'm very old fashioned and uh, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. And uh, this is why I hang on to t basic terms like thought, um, not just thinking, but thought. Thought in, I mean, you're so bit of a library behind me and I'm, I'm, I'm a dinosaur, I know I am. And in a 50 years time, there won't be people like me. There won't be people with their personal libraries. Um, so thought is very important uh, to me. Um, mm. But coming back to, um, to ontology, I think it does have a way, a, a, a part still to play because I want to hang on to this sense that there is a real world. Not only is there a real world that can affect us and that we can affect it, but we have affected it and we've affected it in malign ways. And we've affected both the natural world and we've affected the human world. And we've done that partly through the epistemologies to use that term of the university. University, the modern university, 
old universities went back into the Middle and Near East and Far East, thousands of years. Modern university is only a th thousand years old, came out of the Middle Ages as we know in Europe. And the really modern university only goes back about two to 300 years. And it comes out of modern European thought. And modern European thought, and that's why I mentioned Descartes for me, uh, got us into all sorts of a mess, positing the, the real world, as it were, and, and the knower is separate from each other. But I want still to hang on to the notion that there is an independent world, but the relationships between the two are very complicated, between the knower and the known, but also between human society and the world, but also then between a social institution like the university and the world. Lots of complexity there, interrelationships. The social theorists like um, uh, Barad um, uh, and indeed uh, other feminist writers uh, like, like to use, and I use it myself, the term entanglement. Entanglement is another word that's been has come into our into the philosophy and social theory of education. Again, it's not fully understood. Uh, by the way, it's another complex term, um, but but it at least it it gives us a sense of interwovenness of the world and of the knower and so, uh, social institutions that try to understand the world. So I want to hang on to this notion of a, a new world independent of us, even though we're in it, it's in us, it's in the university. And, you know, if you look at my, that diagram I put up of the university and its eight ecosystems, the ecosystems are in the university and the university is in those ecosystems. There is an interwovenness of the exterior and the internal. Uh, but it's crucial that we hang on to that sense. Otherwise, we're never going to help to improve the world. Uh, and we're certainly and we're never going to be able to begin to rectify the problems that we've created in the world. All right. Okay, probably Cuba freezed uh, for some time. Hello? Hello, Kuba. Yeah, Kuba. Yes, yes. Yeah. Could, 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 could you could, could you ask your question? Ah, okay. Uh, so thank you, Ron, for this wonderful insights uh, and uh, wonderful lecture. I think that this is a really systematic opening from a perspective that, uh, while it's not new for me because I know you're writing and uh, I'm following that for years, but uh, still uh, it is always a challenge for me to situate myself against that uh, that thoughts because it's like, like a simply different national uh, tradition of approaching the things. And I think that uh, I would like to start from a small meta commentary about the language because I really like that you expressed that uh, uh, you feel afraid of these big words and massive words like ontology, and this is like like my self reflection is that why am why am I not scared or afraid of using that words? And maybe it's because of uh, Polish language has not much else to offer. While uh, there is this linguistic difference of doing philosophy of higher education. Which so 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 which we need to have uh, uh, back uh, on our heads uh, uh, while we are having this international conversation over here. That uh, that 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 uh, probably one aspect why you are bombarded with the words ontology and epistemology by your doctoral students is that most of them comes from the different na national settings where they are like cultivated to to philosophical language differently. But uh, this is only a a remark, but uh, uh, I liked, really liked uh, one symptom on your presentation, which is the moment where you uh, counterposed Bhaskar to Popper while taking a side with Popper. And this is like, for me, a nice 
symptomatic aspect of uh, where you stand regarding uh, uh, ontology. This tells me much more, much more than anything else in the presentation, while this is probably a marginal remark. But I wanted to ask you uh, about the role of critique uh, and the university in between the ontology and ideology. Like I would say, I found found that that's something something crucial because I uh, I heard during your presentation a lot of, and this was also clear in the, your last comments, that uh, there is a clear intention that uh, one of the tasks of the university against the crisis of the Anthropocene is to make the world better. So 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 uh, I understand that uh, this. Uh, critical stance is uh, dear to you but could you could you tell some more about how how because if uh, if uh, as Baskar said that uh, the ideas can uh, can make a transformative uh, transformative impact uh, or influence on the uh, on the real uh, what are the modes of this uh, transformation of the real i uh, i always thought that critique uh, and it is also not so not so absent in the fault of uh, idealists like Kant for example uh, critique is this medium of how university can contribute to transforming the real uh, that, sorry it was as always it's uh, during philosophical seminar it's more a comment than a question but uh, yeah the, there is a question in it uh, Anyhow, thank you. Well, gosh, thank you, Christian. Um, I, I, I don't know that I can get to grips with what you've just offered us because you've just offered us uh, so, so much. Um, I mean, the, the, I'll just pick up perhaps a couple of things in what you've just said. Um, I sense that some who know my work have critiqued it or been concerned about it because of this sociologist will what want to call it the normative element my wanting to make the world better um, what i would say there is that the university and western epistemology has not been neutral the western university has had a massive effect upon the world often for good, but often, I'm afraid, in malicious and malign ways. So we can't ignore that, or we shouldn't ignore that. It's not as if we've got a neutral social institution here, and it can just stand back, as it were, and say, nothing to do with me, mate. The university has been involved in the shaping of the modern world, for the last 300 years. And as I say, often, not always, by any means, by any means, but often in malign ways. And therefore we have a responsibility, at least to make sure we don't continue to do any more harm. But if we're doing that, we might as also, also see how we can go on improving the world. And there are some very dismissive people in the world who want to say the university is a, a totally a malicious invention of Western civilization and is doing no good at all and should be uh, just uh, forgotten about or taken apart or, or dismissed or circumvented. I, I don't hold that view. It's a much more complicated situation than that. The university is doing all sorts of good in the world, but it's doing all sorts of harm as well. So we have a responsibility, it seems to me, as a philosopher, to try and understand this situation, this relation, set of very complicated relationships between the university and, and the world. And, and then we have to get into ontology because, as I was saying, we know from Kant onwards, that the world isn't readily available for us. We have to go on doing hard work, getting under the skin of things, going deeper and deeper into things, and knowing that we'll never get uh, to, to, the, to the bottom of things. Um, 
and then on on the um, matter of of critique and the transformation of the real, well, that's incredibly complicated, as I've just Im implied, and I don't think we understand that at all, at all. So here's a, a big topic for those of us in this little world of the philosophy of higher education and the university. How do we understand, or might we understand, this relationship um, between um, ideas, critique, and the world? And by the way, uh, in my work, I've tried to pin down, pin down the very notion of critique. How is it different from critical thought? How is it different from critical thinking? These are all important concepts and they're all fuzzy, and they're, they're, but they're different. Critique is very important here because critique suggests to me that we can understand some of the deeper structures at work and we can evaluate those. Um, and by the way, the universe has always been in the, in the role and function of evaluation, even from its medieval uh, times. And that to me is part of what we mean by critique, getting at the deep structures of the world exposing them, evaluating them, criticizing them, but also discerning other possibilities. And we don't, and as I say, that perhaps wasn't in Basker's philosophy quite enough. So that's partly how I see the university as being, if you like, an engine for ideas, for new frameworks of crit critiquing the structures of the world, as well as the frameworks that we've already put into the world. Uh, this is not easy stuff at all. You, again, you see the word transformation being put into the, the essays and the theses of uh, our students, particularly those interested in educational processes. Uh, that's another word that almost we should abandon, transformation. Uh, just got to go on struggling. That's, let's just talk in those terms, continual struggle. Let's not talk of transformation. Thank you very much. We are running desperately here for, um, out of time. So um, any, any final, final questions? Uh, or maybe Ron, there is something that you would uh, like to add as a sort of uh, cl closing remark to, to, to our meeting today. Well, I can't see anybody else jumping in just now. So I just close with this um, reflection quickly. First of all, thank you very much for giving me the honor of opening up this series, which I hope and think will be a very important series of webinars. Uh, I think this topic of ontology is is not only big, but it's hugely important. And it's one that we haven't engaged with properly in the philosophy of higher education. So I hope some, we'll get something out of this, whether it's a special issue of a, I don't know what we plans we've already got in hand, whether it's a special issue of a journal or whatever it is, but we should try and get something really substantial out, out of this if, if we can. And I just add that I hope, um, again, that we can use this platform, as it were, to encourage others to think big. You know, what I've been trying to get across is that there are so many different interconnections between an institution like the university, education processes, we call them higher education, and the world, and our thought. Um, and we should go on pushing these boundaries, but also trying to see the connections uh, and really think big, but think ambitiously uh, for our field and for our possibilities. And indeed, if I can say so, and people don't like me using the term, think about our responsibilities here. I mean, I'm very pleased that the term responsibility is now beginning to make its appearance in philosophy much more. And so there's a, a literature developing on the very concept of responsibility. And uh, Donna Haraway talks about response, but response ability and differentiates the two. We haven't got time to go into that. So I think it's intriguing, but again, the, that's an interesting idea, but 
I think we do have responsibilities looking forward. We not only have responsibilities looking back, what have we done? What have we achieved? What have we affected? What malign effects might we have had? But we've also got responsibilities looking forward. So the temporal aspect of the notion of responsibility, all of that is to say there are such big issues here. And I hope we will go on trying to open up the windows, bring in more air and develop the conversation in all sorts of imaginative ways. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you, Ron, for accepting our invitation. Thanks to all the participants for joining us today. Uh, this was the first meeting. The next one is on 24th of February, uh, so around a month from now. We will, of course, inform you all about um, about all the details, but just bear this um, date in mind. Our guest will be Andrew G Gibson, who was here with us, so I hope that this conversation will simply continue uh, in February. Once again, thank you for, thank you once again, and, and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very much.